If you're a born crowd pleaser, try this. Making bombs and bullets for the movies. Pushing your luck to win the jackpot. Or abseiling down a world icon. Ways to impress people or extreme jobs. We're told not to play with fire. And as for gunpowder... ..or highly flammable propane gas... ..anyone who handles all this for a living... ..better know something about risk assessment. Johnny Rafik and Nick Rideout are pyrotechnicians. They own and operate Element Special Effects in London. This is what we do. There's no point in worrying about what might happen that morning in terms of whether we're going to come home in one piece. The idea is that we are coming home in one piece and so is the rest of the crew. Good morning, boys. Wise words. Nick and Johnny are specialists and in high demand in film and television. The job begins on the drawing board, planning the next car bomb, gun battle or inferno. Storyboarding reduces the risk of anyone getting hurt. It's imperative for us to test um, before any effect goes out of the workshop, regardless of what it is, it's tested. If it's a, a pyrotechnic effect, as we're going to get in today, you, it, we have to test them down. What they want is the actors to cross frame, so they've got, they've got the arrow drawn there, they're going to cross from left to right. So as they come across, our bullets... You need to understand filmmaking so as much as pyrotechnics. So it looks as though they're just getting out there. And be able to trade off your art against safety. We've basically just laid in five bullet hits into the back of the board, covered them with uh, steel plates to ensure that the charge goes forwards rather than backwards, and then this would normally be fixed up against the wall, and then, to all intents and purposes, you've got a wall with the bullet hits already pripped inside it. A single explosive in the wrong place could end a career, even a life. This may look like boys playing with toys, but imitating danger is deadly serious. Obviously, inherently, what we do is dangerous. See, dangerous. There are, you know, cases throughout, you know, filmmaking where special effects have had, you know, problems on them. You know, touch wood, we've not had anything that's actually hurt anybody or, you know, damaged anything heavily. The next stage is to try the explosives out on an actor. Pay attention now. The devil's in the detail. All sorts of different sizes that we use. Today, the most used size is a D81, which is also known as an aspirin debt. Some days, the smaller half size. And on days when you get the shotguns out, the big twos. These ones actually smart quite a bit when you do them, so... He's lucky today that we're just doing a one. A number one will create an effect of a bullet hole from a handgun. Now comes the hard bit. If the vest isn't tight against your body, because you've got quite a lot of force on top of this, um, when it goes off, it can push the plate back. And if the vest, if you're in a position where the vest's actually sitting off your body, they'll come back and slap against you. Um, but we do get problems sometimes with actors who've never done this kind of thing before, they expect there to be quite an impact. And, and if you get it just right, sometimes they don't even feel it. And we've had guys who just stood there and you, you do the bullet hit and they go, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> the most dangerous thing about it is the artist, because we don't know what he's like, we don't know how experienced he is with this kind of stuff. And, and nine out of 10 accidents that would happen would involve the artist putting his arms or a bit of his body in front of something or going over to the wrong place. Because you've got the three detonators on there, we would then tell the artist exactly where they are so he knows where they are. He'd have a completely choreographed move if he's doing fighting or shooting a gun or something like that. He's got to know that he can't put his arm over here when this detonator's going off. Because although they're completely protected from behind, there's obviously nothing in front of them. You get all that? Yeah.
This is going to be our the crash plane, and this is going to be our gas mall. A gas explosion. Just one of around 50 different spectacles Nick and Johnny stage every year. Can handling deadly explosives ever seem too easy? We've had a long time in the industry using the stuff, so you're used to using it. You're not overzealous with it, you're not daft with it, and you're very respectful of what it could do if it goes wrong. Um, but we have, you know, you have to look at it. These, these are the tools that we use. They also create snow, floods, and of course a lot of smoke for an annual turnover that can reach 400,000 euros a year. It's a volatile trade. Obviously, there's, there's case histories of things that haven't quite worked well. Um, you know, I suppose the most famous of them in terms of, of British film industry is the 007 stage at Pinewood was burnt down one afternoon. But, you know, obviously, there have been effects guys been hurt and, you know, there's been one or two killed over, over the years. But, you know, we, we kind of keep ourselves to our own teams and, you know, share the information. When, we, when one of us knows something's happened, one of us will talk, you know, we'll all talk to each other and say, don't do it this way. Now for the grand finale. Days or weeks of work come down to only three seconds. It has to work. It's a, a cloud of petrol set on fire, so as it goes up into the sky, our main consideration from the minute that it fires is where it lands. It doesn't get more dangerous than this. I mean, there are, there are bigger things to do, but it's black powder, it'll blow your hands off, it'll blow, blow you into little pieces if you get it wrong. But we're ready to load. Yeah. And you guys got to walk away a bit so we can load it up with petrol. The bigger the better for us. The more we can show our skills off, the better. But there's a moment for all of us, and I've, I've spoken to a lot of effects guys, it's when, it, when we're all by our firing boxes, if that's what we're doing, and we're all getting ready to do the effect, and it comes down to the last minute or two, and it's just you guys, the guys you work with all the time, you know, the laughing and joking stops, you can see the anticipation on our faces, then you get the, you know, the 30 seconds, two minutes, whatever, worth of doing, so you're so locked into the job anyhow, nothing else is going on in your life. Three, two, one. So, sound logistics, a cool head, perseverance, and knowing enough chemistry and physics to handle explosives are essential qualities in this job. Maybe staying behind the scenes can be more fun than being in the limelight. How many people does it take to change a light bulb? Answer, one. But you'll need to be an abseiler. Confused, all will be revealed. But first, they are the featherweight champions of the horse world. Some of them are millionaires. We head east to meet a world-class jackpot jockey. This is one of the most prestigious racetracks on the planet, Sha Tin in Hong Kong. Anthony Del Pesh has dreamed of racing in Hong Kong for years. At 36, he's a champion jockey at home in South Africa, winning over 50 races last season. But can he cut it here? The stakes are very high, and uh, that's what attracted me also to come and ride here, the atmosphere, the entertainment of the racing, and, and the stake. High stakes, big winnings, huge risks. My worst accident was in Singapore where uh, um, a horse broke his leg up the straight with me and I uh, uh, lost all my gum in the front. I lost all my front teeth. All my teeth went through my, through my palate. I cut my bottom lip all the way down. I had about 34 stitches in my mouth. That was my worst injury.
Last season, Anthony raced 504 times. His winnings, a cool six million euros. Worth it? You bet. The more you win, the better the rides that come your way from top owners like Lucy Wong. She owns Elvis, who could be Anthony's mount for his first race in Hong Kong. No, there are about six million people in Hong Kong. And to owning a horse, become an owner, there are only 700 people or so. In this way, uh, it is a privilege. Lucy spends over 1,000 euros a month on Elvis. With that kind of investment, Anthony's under scrutiny. Round here, he's unknown. Will Lucy take a chance on him? How, how's this jockey? Uh, yeah, I think, he, I think he may be a good jockey because he's a South African champion. I think you know. Oh, he, he's a he, South African champion. Yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> I never see him you know, how, how he rides, but I think he, I believe he, he may, he's a good jockey. You know. Anthony gets the gig. Despite 20 years in the saddle, he's never complacent. He sets off to do some homework on Elvis. Like the king himself, Elvis the horse is used to celebrity treatment air-conditioned stables and 25 personal trainers. But he's worth it. What makes a good racehorse is, is a horse that can save his energy. And when you work him too, he, he won't overexert himself. You'll have to make him do it, um, and he won't overexert it. Once you've, you've stopped right, wor working him hard, he'll just drop the bridle and, and save his energy. That would be good also. Elvis might be in good shape, but Anthony is injured. Will he make the race? He went so quick and I, I, I fell to the side and I hit my side on the side of the starting stalls. But I think it's just more bruise or maybe just a hairline fracture or something. It's a tense wait for the x-ray results. My results so. Nothing broken, nothing at all broken. See on the other one? I'm happy nothing was broken and it's just a bruise and can get back on. Anthony and his wife Candice are relieved, but it's straight back to training. Every day, he works his horses three hours in the morning, jogs and puts in an hour at the gym. The crowds expect nothing less. Racing is top entertainment in Hong Kong. A million fans, but only 20,000 make it into the exclusive Hong Kong Jockey Club. The takings are guaranteed to be good. The Hong Kong turf accountants handle around 8 million euros a year. They do give some of it to charity, though. Candice waits while Anthony checks in. Will his constant weight watching have paid off? What should I be on there? Well, you know, um, very nervous, obviously. You know, you want to. You want to you want to do well, and I want to enjoy my race, and at the same time I want to stay out of trouble and uh, not cause any interference. And you you got a lot in your mind going before you even get out the starting stalls, and the adrenaline just pumps before you go out there. You need a maverick edge to hack it in the saddle, but also a sensitive side. I told Anthony that a horse is like my baby, you know. Um, if he cannot do it, just leave it. But don't force him to do anything or to hurt him. I've uh, got seven rides. Uh, very excited. I can't wait for it. He's race worthy and under starter's orders. But can this jockey hit the jackpot? And they're off. You miss a start. Anthony loses this race but not his face. He kept Lucy's baby in one piece. One down, six shirts to go. 
I just hope that he can do well in Hong Kong. It's a dream that he's been, he's wanted to write up for so long and finally it's come true and I'll support him all the way. I always have and I always will. This time, Anthony is out in front from the start. I am worried about him quite a lot. Normally during the races, I only watch his colours. I don't watch the races that he's not in. I only follow to make sure that everything goes all right, that he's safe. He scrapes into third place by a neck. No jackpot, but a reward from Candies for still being in one piece. My next goal is to be champion in another country. And uh, this is obviously going to be hard, but that's my next goal. 85,000 spectators have had a cracking day, thanks to jockeys like Anthony, who live daily with pain, hunger and stress, in return for a shot of big winnings and celebrity status. One hundred and sixteen years old, three hundred and twenty four meters high, and one of the wonders of the modern world. Not surprisingly, the French lavish a lot of time, money, and tender loving care on the Eiffel Tower. And without knowing it, six million visitors a year rely on one man with a very rare job. Jean Alex Fauré can say. He's an Eiffel engineer. Our maintenance job is like being part of a factory production line. We make sure the stairs, lifts and electrics work on the tower. If we didn't maintain the factory, there'd be no production. We'd have to close down as there'd be no lift access for people to reach the top. It would be a disaster for the image of Paris and France. This is maintenance on a major scale. 10,100 tonnes of puddle iron needing a coat of paint every five to seven years. That's 60 tonnes of paint at a time. 1,500 paintbrushes, and it takes 25 men a year to complete. And since the tower has already had 17 paint jobs, it must have put on around 1,000 tonnes in weight. The colour at the top is darker than the bottom, so for the distant eye, it looks the same against the Paris sky. To be an Eiffel engineer, you need to be trained in abseiling. Stands to reason, there's no other way of accessing it. A natural sense of balance and ability to stay calm are obvious requirements in this trade. But Jean is a stickler for his safety. Harnesses at all times for the workers. It wasn't always like that. They used to hang on with one hand and paint with the other. Apart from the painters, Jean is responsible for a whole army of unseen workers. Our principal aim is to maintain the Eiffel Tower so that the maximum number of people will be able to enjoy it every day. 6.2 million people a year and up to 30,000 a day. There's lots of wear from people coming through at certain points. Our main job is to keep the machinery working at all times. You need some technical qualifications, but also the ability to learn new techniques on the job that you can't get through studying. Jean is no armchair general. He leads from the front. Today's task is the lights. He'll need 10,000 new bulbs to do all of them. And yes, Jean knows everything you could possibly know about changing light bulbs. The frequency that bulbs are changed depends on their time. The biggest spotlights have a life of around three years. They give the superb golden light inside the tower. The others are standard 40 watt bulbs, changed once a year. It seems like extreme lengths to go to, but this is a national treasure we're dealing with.
climbing out onto the tower never loses its edge. Falling 300 metres would definitely kill you. And the odds are at least one of the thousands of people below too. Even men who have done it for decades like Jean must stay alert. You can also add knowing about knots to the job description and being able to solve problems, however weird. Sometimes workers call me for peculiar technical surprises. For example, this light, which is supposed to be watertight, is actually full of water. But one of the biggest headaches is keeping the lifts in order. They travel over 100,000 kilometers a year. There is one area that tourists don't get to see. Mission Control. This is the old historic semi-automatic security control machinery that's been in use for 90 years. Nowadays we use computers. Although this is in the middle of the machine room, it's not used anymore. Mission Control monitors everything at the touch of a button. But Jean is particularly proud of the 200 tonne counterweights that pull the lift cables up and down. Because they are kept running smoothly by a pretty unexpected substance. They're lubricated to slide inside the piston and we use beef fat which is distilled and refined. We used to use an industrial grease but they don't make it anymore. We had to find another lubricant and we chose the fat used to make fries in Belgium. It's completely edible. You could melt it, add potatoes and you'd have fries. See what good care we take of our old lady? The Eiffel Tower is run on chip fat. You'll be telling us it moves next. Yes, the tower does move, but we can't feel it today because the wind is not very high. The tower moves both because of the wind and because of the sun. The heat of the sun warms one side and the tower will move this way. It's really slow and takes 24 hours. You can feel the wind when there's a heavy gust and the swaying movement can last for three seconds. Luckily, Gustav Eiffel and company took that into account when they designed the tower for the International Exposition of 1889. So, does anything ruffle Jean's calm exterior? I'm not afraid of my work. What we are most afraid of is a madman with a gun, or the guy who wants to jump. The fear exists because it can create a dangerous situation. Falling on someone, or injuring, or killing someone, and that kind of thing, we can't control. What we can control, we are not afraid of. Jean has turned a passion for engineering into a pretty unusual job. Behind the scenes, his dedication keeps millions of visitors in awe of one of the world's greatest sights. Having an impressive job can be tough. You can risk public humiliation, be an unsung hero or the unknown stuntman. Are you cool enough? to handle the heat of an extreme job.